So many of your short stories are set in the continent of Africa, particularly southern Africa. But you are also writing about America. And in that respect, you're addressing the African diaspora as well, which is very pertinent to a museum of the African diaspora. Mm -hmm. And I know you've brought two pieces to read. Yes. And I thought that maybe this would be a good time to start if you would like to read the first very short piece. Okay. For us. Um, this one is called The Droves, and it was written in uh, Zimbabwe right now, my country, I'm from Zimbabwe, as you all most probably know, is emerging from what we call the lost decade, roughly the period between 2000 to 2010, where the country experienced uh, everything from the highest inflation in the world to political violence, failure of leadership. And anyway, as it happens when things fall apart, thousands and thousands of people left the country in droves. So this, you know, this, this was, uh, I wrote this to, to speak to that movement. Very really quick. Look at them living in droves, the children of the land. Just look at them living in droves. Those with nothing are crossing borders. Those with strength are crossing borders. Those with ambitions are crossing borders. Those with hopes are crossing borders. Those with loss are crossing borders. Those in pain are crossing borders. Moving, running, emigrating, going, deserting, walking, eating, flying, fleeing, to all over, to countries near and far, to countries unheard of, to countries whose names they cannot pronounce. They are living in droves. When things fall apart, the children of the land scurry and scatter like birds escaping a burning sky. They flee their own wretched land so their hunger may be classified in foreign lands. Their tears wiped away in strange lands. That the wounds of their despair are bandaged in faraway lands. Their blistered prayers muttered in the darkness of queer lands. Look at the children of the land living in droves, living their own land with beating wounds on their bodies and shock on their faces and blood in their hearts and hunger in their stomachs and grief in their footsteps, leaving their mothers and fathers and children behind, leaving their umbilical cords underneath the soil, leaving the bones of their ancestors in the earth, leaving everything that makes them who and what they are, leaving because it is no longer possible to stay. They will never be the same again because you just cannot be the same once you leave behind who and what you are. Mm -hmm. You just cannot be the same. Look at them living in droves, despite knowing they will be welcomed with restraint in those strange lands because they do not belong. Knowing they will have to sit on one buttock because they must not sit comfortably lest they be asked to rise and leave. Knowing they will speak in whispers because they must not let their voices drown those of the owners of the land. Knowing they will have to walk on their toes because they must not leave footprints on the new earth lest they be mistaken for those who want to claim the land as theirs. <coughs> Look at them living in droves, arm in arm with loss and lost. Look at them living in droves. Just look at them. Thank you very much. And I, the second piece that I'll ask you maybe to read a little bit later is addressing some of those droves who come to America. Mm -hmm. um, you don't specify the place where all these people are going in this particular piece. But what I find interesting about your writing is that you're, as you're exploring issues of migration and exile and, and so forth, it's, you have people coming to the States, but also other countries in the continent of Africa. So one of my favorite stories of yours, and I think some people in the audience have read this, is a story entitled Shamsu. And it's a story about a Zimbabwean who flees, goes to work in South Africa. And I find it a particularly powerful story because you play with this notion of prejudice. Um, so here is the South African character, the Zimbabwean character by the name of Method, who you know, finds all kinds of prejudices and so forth against him when he gets to South Africa, but he brings with him his own prejudice against the people that he ends up working with um, who, end up, who are a gay couple. 
Um, and I think it's a very powerful piece set in South Africa. And I know that you were recently in South Africa. You were doing a residency in Cape Town. And I think there are a few students here who are actually studying, studying Cape Town as a city. And you had mentioned to me that while you were in Cape Town, you were looking around and thinking about new stories. And so, because you've just been there recently, I wonder were there some new stories that struck you, or some of the things maybe that struck you about Cape Town this time around? Um, I, I found Cape Town to be a very interesting uh, space. Uh, most of you might know that South Africa is uh, a, a very young country. It, it got its independence only in '94. And, and being the, you, you get the sense that the, the country is still in some form of, you know, not quite trans, transition, but the ghosts of the past still, still remain uh, up to this day, especially uh, when it comes to issues of race. And somebody who has lived in the U.S. for 12 years, um, I, I found it quite challenging to deal with people, you know, who profiled me because of my race or just expected me to do certain things or talk to me in a certain way. So that was a very um, unending experience for me. That made me uh, think in terms of space and identity. Um, can identity translate? Can you just move to another, you know, another country or another space and be who you are? Or we are subject to those, you know, specific countries and how um, things happen over there. And, you know, most recently, if you follow new, the news, the whole Marikana incident where minors were shot indiscriminately by the police in very apartheid-style fashion, I think that, that was also a story for me that's quite attractive. I'm, you know, especially interested in writing about that. Part of my writing, I think, um, part of my inspiration comes from the things that are actually happening in real life. And a lot has been said about Marikana. You know, so much that you, you get tired of the news and that bombardment. But what I think writing allows us to do, what art allows us to do, is sort of, you know, going through the window when everybody's coming through the door, we go through the window and tell those stories that are not necessarily told, the stories of the wives of the minors and the babies, the children who are waiting for their fathers to come from work, but they want to call them in short dead. So those, those are some of the things that I took away from, uh, from South Africa that I'm looking forward to working on. So speaking of stories that are not told, I was saying to you earlier that mm -hmm. I was thrilled in, in sort of thinking about this evening. I went to your blog and I saw that you had written what I saw as a continuation of Shamiso. Mm -hmm. um, and as a blog entry, you had a letter from the main character's mother. Mm -hmm. Now the main character's mother presumably doesn't know what's happened to the main character, and I won't spoil the story for those of you who haven't read it. Um, but it was very exciting and it seemed very innovative for me to see a writer who continues with, with her story. The story is already published and so forth, but she keeps going. Mm -hmm. And then the second aspect that was just intriguing for me was when I looked at the comments to that particular post. They were all written in Ndebele. Yes. And this is another thing that I find fascinating about you and wonderful, which is that you write not only in English, but you're writing in Ndebele as well. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you can just maybe say a little bit about writing in different languages and you know how you feel about the future of stories um, in different African languages. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I just want to, want to quickly say that the, the whole continuation, um, for me it's like my stories are never, never complete, you know, so that I, I back to the thing of stories that don't get told. I feel like mm -hmm. the mother story, you know, Shamiso's didn't give room for the mother, um, but she's such a haunting figure, and especially knowing that our parents are writing us letters, and now with, with cell phones and whatnot, they are sending text messages, hey, you know, what are you doing, what's going on? So I was trying to see how uh, Methodist mother story would play out. And of course, my sister reads my blog, and she's like, "When are you writing the next letter?" So that's part of why it keeps going. 
in terms of, of language, I am obviously bilingual. I speak to other African languages. But I English is not my first language. I mean, I, you know, I'm supposed to be very, uh, you know, I'm supposed to speak it. But knowing myself and how I write, I, I feel like I cannot quite express myself in English like a native speaker would. I feel like my own uh, languages are interfering with with the English that uh, you know otherwise would end up on the page. And on a conscious level, I, I feel like my my language is more, you know, I feel like it's it's it's, hip, it's, it's better, it's far much better than, than English. I think it's, it's alive. Uh, biases aside, when I say things in, in my language and I say them in English, they sound flat and boring in English. <laughs> so, sorry. Would you like um, to just talk to us for a few minutes so that you can feel more hip? <laughs> 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 Next time, next time. But um, I, I want that to come to, to English. But there's a way of, of having a reader experience who I am, and what my language is like. And I think readers who read closely can actually, you know, tell me. When I was at, at school, in my workshop, people would say, your English sounds a little off, you know, because sometimes it does not sound dramat grammatically correct. But um, you know, it's something that I think is very important. Um, and a lot of writers whose first languages are not English are doing that. And I like to see that happen, especially with young people. And it does, you don't have, you don't even have to hear the second language. I think slang and, you know, street language, you know, uh, young college students have their own ways of speaking. And I like to see them bring that to the page. You know, you don't have to sound like Charles Dickens or whatever to write a story, just write to it the way you speak to your friends. That's what gives you your voice and your character. And when they asked us where we were from, we exchanged glances and smiled with the shyness of child brides. They said, Africa, we nodded, yes. What part of Africa, we smiled. Is it that part where vultures wait for famished children to die, we smiled. When the life expectancy is 35 years, we smiled. Is it where the old president rigged the election and people were tortured and killed, and a whole bunch of them put in prison and all? There, where they are also dying of cholera. Oh my God, yes, we know your country. It's been on the news. And when those words tumbled from their lips like crushed bricks, we exchanged glances again, and the water in our eyes broke. Our smiles melted like dying shadows, and we wept. Wept for our blessed, wretched country. We wept and wept, and they pitied us and said, It's okay, it's okay, you are in America now. And still we wept and wept and wept, and they gave us soft little thingies and said, here is some Kleenex, here. And we took the soft thingies and put them in our pockets to look at later. And we wept still, wept like widows, wept like orphans. In America, we saw more food than we had seen in all our lives. At McDonald's, we devoured Big Macs and wolfed down fries and guzzled supersized cokes. At Burger King, we worshipped whoppers. At KFC, we mowed bucket chicken. We went to Chinese buffets and ate all we could inhale. Fried rice, chicken, beef, shrimp, and as for the things whose names we could not read, we simply pointed to and said, we want that. Mm. But how America surprised us at first. If you were not happy with your body, you could go for a doctor, for instance, and say, doctor, I was born in the wrong body. Just make me right. Doctor, I don't like this nose, these breasts, these lips. We looked at people sending their aging parents away to be taken care of by strangers. Mm. We looked at parents not being allowed to beat their own children. We looked at strange things like this, things we had never seen in our lives, and we said, what kind of land is this? Mm. Just what kind of land? 
We did not have the money for school, and so we went to work. Our social security card said valid for work only with INS authorization, but we gritted our teeth and broke the law and went. What else could we do? What could we have done? What could anybody have done? And because we were breaking the law, our heads fell with shame. We had never broken any laws before. Drought because we were no longer people. We were now illegals. And the jobs we went. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Those jobs. No paying jobs. Debt breaking jobs. Jobs that now at the, at the bones of our dignity devoured the meat, turned the marrow. We took irons and ironed our pride flat. We cleaned toilets. We picked tobacco and fruit under the boiling sun until we hung our tongues and painted like lost hounds. We butchered animals, slit throats, drank blood. Mm. We worked with dangerous machines, holding our breaths like crocodile underwater, our minds on the money and never on our lives. Mm. And years later, there came the times we called home and young strangers answered the phone and we said, who are you? And they said, I'm Tawani's son, Lumide. I'm Yarai's daughter, Trisha. I'm Prayer's second child, Karikai. We listened to these strangers and said, Jesus, Tawani is a parent now. Nyarai is a daughter now. When did it happen? When did all these children have their own children? That is how time went. It flew and we did not see it flying. We did not go back home to visit because we did not have the papers for our return. And so we just stayed, knowing that if we went, we would not be able to re-enter America. We stayed like prisoners. Only we chose to be prisoners, and we loved our prison. It was not a bad prison. And then our children were born, and we held their American birth certificates to the sun. When our parents reminded, reminded us over the phone that it had been a long, long time and that they were getting old and needed to see us, needed to meet their grandchildren, we said, We are coming, Mama. Siabuya Baba. We are coming, Goko. Chukia Sekuru. We did not want to tell them we still had no papers. Mm -hmm. And when they grew restless and cursed America for being the dirty monster that swallowed their children, swallowed the sons and daughters of other lands and refused to spit them out, we said, we are coming very soon. We are coming next year. And next year came and we said, next year. Mm -hmm. When next year came, we said, next year for sure. And when next year for sure came, we said, next year for real. Mm -hmm. And when next year for real came, we said, we are coming. You'll see, just wait. And our parents waited and they saw so that we did not come. They died waiting, clutching pictures of us leaning against the Lady Liberty in their dried hands, graves of lost sons and daughters in their hearts, old eyes glued to the sky for Fulamachinas to bring forth lost sons and daughters. We could not attend their funerals because we still had no papers, and so we mourned from afar. We shut ourselves and turned on the music so we did not raise alarm. We whisked on the floor and wailed and wailed and wailed. And with our parents gone, we told ourselves, we have no home anymore. Who would we go to see in that land we left behind? We convinced ourselves that we now only belong with our children. And those children, they grew and we had to squint to see ourselves in them. They did not speak our language. They did not sound like us. When they misbehaved, we only said, no, don't do that. Stop. Time out. But that is not what we wanted to do. What we wanted to do was get switches and draw blood and teach red row lessons to last them lifetimes. But we feared being arrested for bringing up our own children like our parents had brought us up. We also accepted many things as our children grew, things that baffled us because we had been raised differently. But we took it all in and said, there is no journey without a price, and this is the price for the long journey we made those many years ago. 
When our children became young, young adults, they did not ask for our approval to marry. We did not get bright prizes. We did not get gifts. At their weddings, we did not spill beer and tobacco on the earth. Did not preach drums to thank our ancestors. We smiled. And when our children raised their families, we did not tell them what to do, how to bring up their children. They hardly came to see us. They were busy with jobs and their new lives. They did not send us monies like we had sent our parents. When we grew old, they did not beg us to stay with them. When we grew very old, they put us in these nursing homes where we were taken care of by strangers. Strangers who had left their countries just like we left ours those many years ago. When we died, our children only cried. They did not know how to wail, how to mourn us the right way. They did not go mad with grief. They did not pin black cloth on their arms. They did not spill beer and tobacco on the earth. They did not sing till their voices were hoarse. They did not put our plates and cups on our graves. They did not send us away with proper trees. We left for the land of the dead naked. We felt the things we needed to enter the castle of our own ancestors. Because we were not proper,